heart is probably my favorite organ, and there's so many different reasons as to why that's true. But something I want to show you that never ceases to amaze me is just how cool it looks on the inside. Now, if you look and see this white flap thing up top, that's called the mitral valve, and it separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. And what's attached to it are these things called the chordae tendini. Those are your literal heartstrings. The heart is just the workhorse of the body. This thing beats, on average, two and a half to three billion times over your lifetime. Today I want to talk about appendicitis. Believe it or not, this tiny little thing right here is your appendix. If it gets to be about the size of your index finger, you run the risk of it rupturing. And if that happens, bacteria will make its way into your abdominal cavity and you could go septic. A question that I get a lot is, what is the difference between muscle tissue and tendons? You see, tendons emerge from muscles. Muscles are normally wrapped in a bunch of connective tissue layers. So as the muscle cells end, the connective tissue layers continue on. And what happens is they then blend with a bone and they cross a joint. So when the proteins of the muscle contract, it ends up pulling on the tendon, which causes a movement to occur at the joint. I want to talk about the spleen. So the spleen is going to be on the side of the liver and your stomach on your left side. So this doesn't really do it justice. It's much bigger than this. So watch as I kind of pull this thing out. It's about the size of your hand, like you could fit it in your palm. Now, the spleen is going to have multiple functions. It helps break down red blood cells. It helps um, store blood in case you lose too much. It's a, essentially a giant lymph node, but yeah, that's your spleen. It's just going to be hanging out on your left side, right by your stomach. What you're looking at here is part of your upper digestive tract, and we can see part of the tongue, your Adam's apple or thyroid cartilage, the thyroid gland, your trachea, and if I scoot that to the side, we can see your esophagus, your food tube, as it turns into your stomach. Your stomach is then going to turn into your duodenum, or part of your small intestine. But let's say you just ate some food, so you swallowed it and it fell down into the stomach. The stomach is then going to start contracting and bathing it in stomach acid or hydrochloric acid, and it acts like a, a cement mixer. You can literally picture your stomach doing these contractions and moving the substance around until it turns into a paste called chyme. But let's say you secrete too much stomach acid, or let's say you're pregnant and the stomach gets scooted up super flat. The stomach acid can then be pushed up your esophagus and start to burn the esophageal lining where you don't have the protection that the stomach has. We call that heartburn or acid reflux. I want to talk all about shin splints. So you see right here, this is your shin bone or your tibia, and it's covered in a piece of tissue called the periosteum. Now over here, we can see what's called fascia, and that's on top of muscles. There's a very unique relationship that these have to one another, and you can see that the fascia blends into the periosteum. One of the leading theories as to what shin splints is, is that this fascia causes an irritation and inflammation of the periosteum, and that can create a lot of pain. But there's other theories, and if you're interested, I filmed a longer YouTube video all about shin splints that you can go ahead and look at now on our YouTube channel. So I want to show everybody the tools that an anatomist will use for dissection. So we have surgical scissors, tweezers, a scalpel and blade, and then an interesting tool called a hemostat. Now this thing is kind of a clamp, but it allows us to grab onto the tissue and provide a lot of tension. But most of, believe it or not, most of all dissection is going to be performed with these two structures here and the hemostat. A scalpel is almost never used, except under very special circumstances. Your liver is capable of true regeneration. It can regrow itself with as little as 25 to 35% of it. So kind of think about this much here, regrowing the rest of this organ. This is the largest organ in the body other than your skin. Now, the thing to understand though is even though it regrows, that doesn't mean it keeps its same shape. It will come back in a really bulbous, atypical type of shape. And the other thing to also understand is it will not regenerate unless you have healthy cells. See this? This is cancer. This cancer spread to this cadaver's liver from his colon. So what that means is he did not have healthy enough cells to help regenerate and, well, have a healthy liver.